Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Harvey Young from the class of 1993. Dr. Young is the Dean of the College of Fine Arts at Boston University. He's published uh, seven books. His most rec recent book is called Embodying Black Experience. And he is going to talk to us today um, about um, race and gender communication in America. So without further ado, Dr. Young, take it away. Uh, hey, well, it's, it's good to see everyone. Um, I think I, uh, I, I had an impromptu one where I, I attended a Jim Swartz uh, um, cocktail making uh, event. So it's good to see you, Jim. Good to see everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, my goal for this is to be pretty uh, low key and straightforward uh, with this. So I'll offer a few uh, just sort of opening comments, probably about, yeah, maybe like seven or eight minutes or so. Uh, I want to share my screen so you have some images to look at in, in, in common, and then we'll just have whatever conversation you want to have about what I talked about or could be about anything else, truly anything else. <laughs> you know, so I'm going to share my screen and then let's dive into this, okay? All right. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the key thing is that when you're talking about, my, my, my framing for this is that if you want to think about, you know, how we talk about and communicate race and gender, um, you know, the first thing is that people will often say, you know, I don't see color, right? Like, and, and that's, it's, it's often meant to be, it's thought of as, um, you know, sort of the highest form of sort of, uh, of, of just self-disclosure in terms of not being sort of racially, uh, sort of overly conscious or sort of racist per se. Um, but what I always sort of say is like, imagine if this person you see on the screen here uh, were to go missing in a, in a large crowd, uh, and you had to find that person, you had, to, you had to enlist other people to ask you, how would I, you know, help me find this person? They'd say, what does he look like? Uh, and if you were to be like, well, he's wearing suspenders, <laughs> right? You know, like that may not be the most effective way of letting people know um, you know, how to find a person, right? You know, so, you know, you know, like, you know, when we say that we're actually not looking at color, we don't see color, we're actually denying that person's, um, you know, sort of self, that sense of, of who they are. You know, so here is what reminds me of this Harvard campaign, which is like when they say, I mean, someone says, I don't see color, you know, the question is, does that mean you don't see me? Uh, or you can think about Stephen Colbert, you know, when he's sort of in the, in the uh, Colbert report uh, before his current talk show, where he'd say like, you know, you know, I don't see race, I evolved beyond that. I just pretend that everyone's white and it's all good. You know, so it's really a way of just sort of, A, at the very beginning of this, I want people to feel comfortable acknowledging the fact that one sees, you know, color, one sees uh, complexion. And you should, if you should, if you were to deny the fact you even see it, uh, then you are denying the sort of the presence, the humanity, the experience of other people. Now, what I want to do today is I just want to offer sort of three quick ways in which one can sort of think about the operations of race. Um, and, you know, so here I'm going to give you this, this, this basic sort of standard intersectionality chart. And what that chart is, is it's, um, it's a way of thinking about all the things that come together to make us who we are. Um, so, you know, for example, you know, you might think of like, if, you know, like, like what makes you you? What makes you uniquely you, right? And it's your combination of your education, it's your sexuality, it's your ability, sort of your physical ability, that is. It's your age, gender, ethnicity, culture, religion, language, class, race. It's all those things. And all those things come together to sort of make you uniquely you. Um, and I want you to sort of be aware of that because we tend to sort of essentialize ourselves into one thing or more the point we tend to essentialize others. Uh, but if you were to think about like, you know, what are those things that are sort of part of myself, some of them are physically sort of tied to your body in terms of its current state, which can change, one's health can change, but also some of the things you acquire, education, things you acquire, class status, things you acquire, um, you know, or, or you can lose, physical ability, right? So those are things I want you to be aware of in terms of those things that make you uniquely you. Um, you know, so for example, here I just have a um, an image uh, to share with you, which is you can see how the intersection, the sort of the overlapping concentric circles of these identity points uh, sort of construct a sense of an experience of life, right? So you can see that all three people here have sort of the shared attribute of whiteness, right? But their lived experience will differ based upon age, based upon gender, based upon physical ability, right? So you would say that just because they all have the same sort of racial identity doesn't mean they have the same lived experience. And that's what I want you to be aware of. How do we complicate um, our understanding of, of, 
of, of how race, how gender, how these different factors come together to inform our sense of who we are and, and, our, and our assumptions of other people. Um, you know, so there's three things that I sort of like to think about. Socialization is one of them. Uh, you know, habitus um, uh, or intersectionality sort of, you know, as embodied is the second one. And the third is um, uh, interpolation, right? Sort of being called out. So the first one is socialization. And that's simply that we are taught how to play our assumed race or gender and exposed at an early age to racial or gendered thinking and logic. Uh, and you might say, well, that seems kind of obvious, but let me give you a couple examples of this, right? You know, so, you know, the first is like, if you think about sort of Thanksgiving day dinners, there's this, it's, it's almost meme-ish <laughs> these days, the thought of um, the racist uncle, the person in your family who sort of says the objectionable thing that's totally not PC, it's not right, it's not politically correct. Um, you know, and that sort of circulates. In fact, it's the thing that actually causes a lot of angst for, you know, college students, for example, who are returning home and then sort of finding people who are not accepting of, of their life choice or whatever else. Um, you know, and this is an example of socialization. It's the idea that there are these elements within your life that will say things, um, you know, that will frame your outlook, um, will, will frame how you think about uh, other people, whether it's other people's physical ability, gender, race, all those indices we looked at previously. Um, you know, so to acknowledge the fact that what is said in a household, uh, what is said under one's roof, uh, structures a person's outlook um, and a sense of whether they can accept or project um, uh, their assumptions across others. Um, or you think about uh, children, right? You know, and if you ever want to see a great example of socialization, it's, you know, children. Uh, and it's more the point how adults engage with newborn babies, <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, for example, uh, if you were to, um, you know, give a baby boy a pink hat, for example, you know, just pause, wait a few seconds, and you can imagine the sense of anxiety and angst that might sort of cross uh, some people's uh, faces because they'd be like, no, 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 they feel like they have to assert uh, the gender identity of that kid. Um, or in terms of dolls, right? You know, the issue of you go grocery shop, if you go you know, toy shopping, and you know, which complexion doll do you give your kid? Um, you know, do you give your boy child a doll or not? You know, and those are all things that come together uh, to inform how we sort of socialize and create a sense of expectations around race, around gender, uh, how we sort of uh, make assumptions that become everyday and embodied uh, and accepted and embraced. You know, and we all do it. And I want us to understand how that gets performed, how it's operated uh, in the world we live in, uh, because we're all subject to these things. Um, habitus. Uh, this is a sociological concept, um, you know, but it's basically the idea that, um, you know, one embodies these social expectations and they inform our behavior to the point where it becomes almost unconscious, right? You know, so, you know, and the example I'm going to give here, and I stole this, and I apologize uh, for stealing this from the uh, CHS website, uh, but uh, you might think of, of, of you know, the, the daily habit of tying one's tie, let's say, or having to wear a tie, you know, like there's really nothing inherently normal about that, <laughs> you know, like, 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 like what, uh, you know, 10 year old, do you know, or 12 year old, you know, just kind of wakes up the morning. is like, I want to throw in a tie today, right? Like that doesn't happen, but we sort of structurally, uh, sort of create a sense of expectations that, you know, the way you are going to be a young man in the world, a professional in the world is you're going to look a certain way. You're going to dress a certain way. Um, and then that becomes embodied, you know, to the point where it can be an event like today, you know, where like I'm talking to CHS folks and I'm hyper aware of the fact that I'm not wearing a tie. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it, it becomes this sort of embodied thing. Uh, and, and I want you to sort of acknowledge the fact that these things happen in life where uh, you're taught certain things. There are certain rituals you perform, you know, like there, what, how to behave when you enter a church, how you sort of interact with people. Those are things that you're socialized into doing and you acquire those sort of those tastes, those habits, and they become so much of, so much of a part of you, it, it becomes almost unconscious, right? And, and that happens again and again and again. Uh, so if there are like sports rituals that you uh, learn, for example, like those are things that become part of your, your, your sense of self, your habits. Um, uh, and the last thing I want to just offer, you know, in this sort of very quick sort of overview is interpolation, right? And interpolation is really the sense of when a sort of empowered social structure uh, sort of comes in and imposes uh, an assumption around one's identity uh, aspects, right? You know, so it's the fact that you get called out literally um, and then sort of made to sort of be aware of how you are being seen by other people. 
so the example here uh, that's most often given uh, by uh, Louis Althusser is, is simply a police officer. Like you're walking down the street, you're, you're living your normal life, and the police officer says, stop, right? Uh, and you stop, you know, and in stopping, you're acknowledging the fact that this person and their presence in the world has some control over you, right? Um, um, if you think of, of uh, schools, for example, schools are good examples of, of how there are these different layers of, of power structures that are at play uh, in which there's authority that exists um, that can sort of mark and, can, and, and, and limit uh, one's ability to do whatever they might want to do, right? Uh, and that's kind of interpolation, this idea of being called out. Now you might say, well, how does interpolation sort of apply in the world? Well, it's often we encounter it within most in, in negative settings, right? So if you think about um, this case in Georgia, um, um, right now, um, you know, Ahmad Arbery, right? You had the idea of a young man just running, just running, living his life, um, uh, just in his own neighborhood, just doing like, you know, like a, a normal day as usual. Uh, and he's running by. Uh, and then it's when that pickup truck of those two guys with shotguns who decide, um, you know, to call him out, right, you know, to uh, assert that, you know, his presence, his blackness, his body does not belong in that setting. Um, and then that's a case of where this sort of uh, enforced authority, in this case backed up by a gun and violence, actually wounds a person um, um, on, you know, on the grounds of some level of discrimination or racism, right? You know, or you can look at, um, you know, the experiences of women uh, and, and, and their self-disclosures in terms of just like, like living their lives in their bodies every day as women, right? Uh, and here I have something from Marquette, uh, which sort of acknowledges the fact that, right, the middle stat, 80% of, har uh, of harassed women said their street harassment encounters occurred between the ages of 13 and 25, right? You know, so when we think about socialization, when we think about habitus, you know, so what are we doing to actually make sure that um, everyone when we know, especially the young men, you know, at Canisius, you know, are being respectful to the women who are down the street at Narden, right? You know, and not sort of replicating these cycles of violence. Um, um, when we acknowledge the fact that 61% of women reported uh, being the targets of sexually suggestive comments every day or often by strangers in public places, right? So what are we doing to sort of stem that, to prevent that from happening? Yeah, but these are things in which a person is just living their life. They're walking down the street and it, it's, it's, it's these things right here. It's these different indices of race, education, sexuality, ability, age, gender, ethnicity, culture, language, class, race. That's just you being you. But then in that moment when Arbery's jogging down the street, right, you know, and it's, own, his, it's his own neighborhood, you know, that's when he gets called out for being black, right? You know, it's the woman who has these complicated identities, you know, when, you know, sort of sexual harassment happens, gets called out for her gender for her sex, for her, and her sexuality as well, right? You know, the fact that she's a woman. Um, those are things, you know, that happen again and again. And so sometimes what happens is that when one thinks about, um, you know, how they self-identify, one often self-identifies based upon the aspect of themselves that is most threatened, right? So uh, in a room in which uh, you are the only one of X, you're gonna be hyper aware of that part of yourself, right? So you'll be the only man in a room full of women, you're hyper aware of the fact that you're a man. Um, you know, if you know, you're the only Catholic in a room of people who are not Catholic, uh, you'll be aware of that, right? If you are the only person who's in a wheelchair, right? Uh, and this happens quite often, and you're at an event in which um, you know, uh, you know, there are stairs, it's not accessible, you're hyper aware of your status uh, as being disabled. You know, so I want us to be sort of conscious not only of these intersections of identity, but also how we all have a role in not actually, in A, acknowledging those intersections as real things, B, seeing those intersections as part of the core experience of people, but then, you know, C, making sure that we're not acting in a way uh, to delimit people's possibilities simply because they have something that differs from our own. Um, so an example that I like to think of as often quite positive is sports, right? You know, so you could say within this world of habitus, you know, one of them I might choose to create is the idea of being a Bills fan, right? Um, and that cuts across it all. So in that moment, um, you know, I'm feeling embraced and you can sort of see, you know, regardless of your, your, your age, your gender, um, your sexuality, uh, your, so, your social class at that moment, although there is a price challenge there, obviously, for some people, um, you know, assuming you can get in the room, there's not accessibility issues, you know, that's a place where you can connect and bond, right? And that's how community can happen 
while difference can still be allowed. But even when you're looking at this picture here of these Bills fans, I want you to acknowledge the fact that each person there has their own individualized lived experience. They're each unique because of how those indices of, of all these things come together to sort of make them who they are. You know, so that's my very quick, very kind of fast, and I'm gonna stop my share, um, sort of overview of how these things work related to sort of race within um, society. So that's my quick, quick thought. I don't know. What do we call it? Toss, toss to you. <laughs> you know. But let's talk about whatever you want to talk about. You know. And this, this, you know, could be along these lines. Could be about other things. Um, so what shall we? What shall we talk about? And feel free to unmute yourselves. And there, there, there's we're a small enough group that you should be able to do that and just open it up. All right, Harvey. I unmuted myself. Go for it, Jim. All right. So, so one thing you mentioned um, that I, I think is a a, a, a powerful uh, phenomenon that, that happens all the time, um, and sometimes it's on race lines, sometimes it's disability lines. Frequently, it's socioeconomic lines. What are the what are the ways to to use that moment as an opportunity to? identify with somebody, to connect with somebody who might feel in that moment marginalized? Yeah, um, so it's, well, I mean, it's, so can, can you give me an example? Yeah, so let's use your example. Um, I had a class my senior year of college that was a, uh, it was a gender and international relations class, and I was the only man in the room. Right. And uh, your point about being hyper aware of your difference from the rest of the group in that moment was real. I mean, it was a real moment. And um, I think one thing that um, I struggled with at that time um, and everybody else in the room struggled with was how do we sort of acknowledge um, old Jim over here, you know? And it's frankly, it's one of the few moments in my life where it's like, I'm re I was really, you know, sort of a, um, a, a true, um, outlier in a group, you know, I mean, usually I'm kind of blend in most places, but, um, you know, what are the different, what are the different communication techniques? What are the different ways of I both acknowledging the difference and um, making it sort of um, and presenting an opportunity to include others in, 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 in that moment? Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, a couple things. Uh, the first is if it's a case where you're, encountering someone um, who is the person who's often uh, not in the majority in that setting, right? So this is a different, this is a different scenario. Um, you know, then I think that you want to do is you want to acknowledge the fact that that person's experience is not going to be the same as other people in the room, right? You know, so to be the only guy uh, in that class uh, that you were in, um, you know, like, you know, there were certain things that you had to sort of overcome, right? There, it's like, like, whether it's a personal anxiety or whatever it else, you know, in the same way, if it's a woman um, in a, a majority male discipline, right? Um, you know, that you want to acknowledge the fact that that person has a different level of experience um, um, and a different level of comfort necessarily within that, within, that, within that room. You know, so just the first thing to do is just to really acknowledge, you know, you know how important it is that they're there I think that's that's key. Um, you want to listen to and hear and and point the fact that you understand um, is that that you understand their experience, right? But but you want to be able to say that you um, you know appreciate the fact that they are there, right? If you're if you're in the minority in that setting and it's a uh, um, you know the, the the scenario you gave, I think that you know the key thing to do is to listen, right? You know because it's it's your presence and actually hearing experiences. Uh, that are shared that makes a difference, right? So I mean, so it's 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 about just understanding what precedes a person walking to the room. Uh, that's the most important thing you can do. Um, you know, the one other thing I would I would add is that if it if it's if it turns if it's connecting with people, um, you know, really use and leverage the, 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 you know, that wheel of 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 experiences, you know, and then find a way to connect with a person, right? And you might actually seek out a person you know who you feel like is alone or or is unique in that setting and find a point of connection and if you sort of think about that wheel again everyone has at least one or two points of connection with someone else right you know so so, so find that um, you can develop a real sort of true connection uh, but then sometimes if you uh do what most people do which is just like i'm not going to uh i'll wave at a distance but not have the conversation then that person remains othered 
um, and not welcomed in. Yeah. Harvey, this is Rajiv. On the hey there. Hey, hey, what's up? It's good so to see you. Uh, good to see you too. This is great. On the flip side of it, sometimes I feel that we, um, or that I, we, that I um, purposely avoid some of this conversation. So if I'm giving a lecture to a class, right, and I'm talking about race, I'll be like drawn to talk, like part of me, like my implicit bias or whatever it is, wants to go and direct my conversation to the minority students in the room. Mm -hmm. And I have to consciously think, don't do that or single them out. Or, you know, and I wanted to ask you about this one cause, because given your profession, when I, when we go see a theater performance, we go to a lot of theater here in DC and they do blind casting. Mm -hmm. It's like this thing, like an intermission that we don't talk about. Yes. Race blind class. Like, but everyone wants to say like, isn't it kind of weird that like the parent is like one white person, an Asian woman and like <laughs> a black kid. <laughs> it's, we never, we know it is there, but you have to feel really comfortable with somebody during intermission to have that conversation and talk about the fact. So it, I mean, I, I don't know what, I don't know if there's a question in there, but I don't, or your response or. Yeah, anything. I mean, it's, it's a, um, I mean, I think that uh, just the, in two parts, the first is within a conversation with people to acknowledge that uh, we all have these experiences. And I think that too often we, um, you know, sort of look to the, uh, you know, the underrepresented group, you know, over in the room to be like, speak of your experiences and your oppression, <laughs> right? You know, like, uh, and, 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 you know, sort of you know, tell me about racism, right? You know, and it's, and, and you want to actually sort of point out the fact that you know, we're all subject to, we're, we, we all live in the same world and we're subject to, um, you know, these experiences and these conversations, um, you know, I mean, I mean, they hit us differently. Let's acknowledge that they hit us differently in the, on the day to day, uh, but we can't absolve ourselves from the conversation around race. We can't absolve ourselves about the, from the conversation around sexism um, um, uh, and all the isms out there, right? So I think that's, that's a key thing. Now for theater, like with, with uh, colorblind casting, uh, you know, that itself is its own uh, challenge because it's like there's a point where audience members are just trying to be like, that's an odd choice and I don't understand what's going on. And there's always this point of confusion. You can feel it, you know, in the theater uh, because people are like, is this supposed to be this way? Is there a deeper meaning attached to this casting? Uh, and usually it takes you about 15 minutes to, you know, to, to find out whether, you know, uh, the, the casting choices you know, we're purposeful in terms of like it's color conscious in which you know sort of race or gender casting is going to inform the character or if it's color blind and you're like oh they just cast like you know whomever they thought um uh, auditioned best for that role right you know but it but there's always that moment in the first 10 or 15 minutes of a play you know where you're trying to figure out okay is this intentional or in, like how intentional is this casting choice um yeah what else is there can we talk about Harvey, I had a question for you. I saw a video um, of you talking about how Dr. King warned us about um, socioeconomic injustice and, and poverty and the growing divide between the haves and have nots. And you sort of mentioned that it's a lesser known part of his career. And we obviously talk about that a lot here at the school. Um, can you talk about his thoughts on the subject and you know, did he have any ideas on how we could fix that? Well, I mean, if you think about it, you know, so at the very last, you know, the, the, you know, the last few years of uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, life were to campaign, was, was campaigning about, um, uh, it, was, it was poverty and also sort of uh, economic inequality, right? Um, and saying that, you know, if, if um, sort of the ongoing concerns around race and racism were impactful and needed to be sort of fixed in the 50s and 60s, you know, the, you know, um, you know, you know, the, you know, the, the, the challenges, you know, towards the, toward the end of his life, right? You know, was this sort of perpetual um, uh, sort of creation, this creation of an underclass, right? You know, so people who, um, you know, couldn't pay their bills, who couldn't afford health care, who couldn't afford a home, who, you know, all those things, right? So he held a big convening in Chicago. Uh, it was a war on poverty. And that's actually when, if you hear about the stories of, of, of Martin Luther King Jr. Having a, rock, having a brick thrown at him, um, uh, it was during that campaign against poverty. Now, the thing about, um, uh, the, the, the thing that he encountered with that was that, you know, there was quite a fair amount of objection to his work, right? You know, so it wasn't that, a lot of people can generally say, yeah, like ending racism is a good thing, you know, but dismantling sort of a capitalistic structure uh, that, 
um, allow certain people to profit and other people to be, you know, sort of permanently less well off, you know, like that requires a fair amount of undoing, right? Uh, you, can, you can see it in this world we live in right now, right? You think about um, access to healthcare uh, and those who are sort of severely um, uh, sort of financially ruined and devastated because of healthcare costs, right? You know, so, so, so that becomes part of King's legacy. It's like, how do we address those issues? Um, you know, and we don't spend enough time talking about class, right? Like if you think about it, um, you know, sort of social class is often, you know, the, you know, sort of is, 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 is one of the key limits uh, to one's ability to sort of succeed and progress within society, right? You know, everything from um, ability to, um, you know, have what's needed for education to be able to afford a college education, for example, or afford a high school education as well, which is why I know that a lot of the work around um, for scholarships and making uh, C, uh, CHS accessible has been so important. Um, you know, so that's a big thing. You think about sort of, again, access to healthcare, and that's a huge thing. Um, you know, uh, everything from being able to get to work, how one gets to work, right? You know, think about this COVID moment where you're an essential worker, but you don't have a vehicle, right? You know, so you're, you're dependent upon public transportation, how you're at risk, right? Uh, again, think about the service industry, you know, the people who are, you know, working at Wegmans right now, you know, because, you know, they, they, they need the income, but also we need them working there, right? You know, so it's like, like there's a way in which uh, the, you know, this, the, the, um, sort of poverty and then being part of sort of a, a perpetual underclass sort of financially, so socio socioeconomically, is something that we don't spend enough time talking about. Um, and that is something that King wanted us to do. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say, um, you know, that's a really good point. One thing, at least, and I'm sure this isn't common, this isn't um, uh, uncommon around the country, but here in Atlanta, one of the uh, major issues that, is, that has come out of the, the uh, COVID pandemic is that uh, two things. One is that the notion of healthcare being tied to your employment is being um, really challenged uh, for a whole new group of people because people who felt that they were very secure in their employment now have no jobs. So we have 30 million Americans unemployed right now and it's going to get worse. Um, and so people who for a long time had been very much against um, some government provided or single payer type healthcare system now are going to have their minds changed about that as they wipe out their, their personal uh, net worth. Um, they're perhaps losing their homes because of healthcare costs related to the uh, coronavirus. The, the second point is the one you made about transportation and historically here in Atlanta, um, transport, mass transportation in particular has been a highly racialized issue. Um, and, you know, what, what has happened is if you look at the transit map in Atlanta, you can quickly identify the communities on the outskirts of Atlanta that were simply unwilling to assist or fund public transportation because primarily they were worried about Black Atlantans coming to the suburbs. Um, and one thing I will say is that I do think that in the last 10 years, um, you know, as Atlanta was building its new baseball stadium, for example, that issue and the discussion of race around it and how um, historical and still current feelings about race in the South as Atlanta became more diversified, both from people coming from outside the region and in terms of um, ethnic groups that are here. Uh, people are more willing to discuss that and talk about it. And it's in the papers and it's on the news and it's in you know, around the water cooler. So I think that's at least a positive step where to your point, people are talking about it. Right. I mean, I mean it's just, just a little random anecdote, but you know, that, that's part of my job. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, um, if you, um, if you look at high school, if you look at highways rather, um, you know, sort of highways um, uh, sort of cutting through cities, like um, uh, that itself has, a, that, that itself has its own um, sort of racialized history. Right, you know, so even if you look at in Buffalo, for example, um, you know, sort of where the where the highway goes, uh, and the neighborhoods that were essentially devastated, you know, sort of economically, uh, because they were because the highway went like, literally right through the middle of it, um, and that exists in Buffalo, it exists in L.A., it exists in so many places. Um, so you can sort of see how again this this this, you know, the 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 imbrication here of sort of race and 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 socioeconomic status can come together, right, where you actually could have a a fairly well-to-do neighborhood. Uh, that because of of um, a discriminatory policy, you know, gets uh, financially wounded uh, by some choices uh, that were made related to, in that case, highway uh, uh, zoning. Uh, Harry, we have a, a chat question that's going to 
have us switch gears a little bit. So oh, if you could talk about your journey from Canisius High School to BU. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so uh, um, I, I, I was, I was a Canisius. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was there um, and I loved, I loved every bit of Canisius. Um, you know, I, I, after Canisius, I went to, went to Yale uh, for college. Um, and, and uh, I was, I was that, I was that kid people kind of make fun of that I had for a, a year or so, um, you know, sort of uh, Canisius high school posters um, in my, in, in my dorm room, and then people were like, "Why do you have your high school posters in, my, in your dorm room?" I was like, "Because it's a great high school." Um, uh, and then I uh, just sent them away. Basically, I did that, uh, you know. But I, I was a film major at I was a film major at Yale, um, and I thought I was going to law school. Actually, I really thought about going to law school, and I took my LSATs, and I did I did well enough, I think, to get into like a a very good law school, maybe top 10, top 20 at least. Uh, and I was at the post office because like back then you couldn't just like hit a button. You had to actually physically um, mail out your applications. And I realized that I didn't want to be a lawyer. You know, I, I, I thought about it and I didn't actually know anyone who was a really happy lawyer. Uh, I knew people who were happy with their lifestyles as, as, as lawyers, but I didn't know anyone who sort of personally was like, I love my job as a lawyer. And this is, mind you, uh, when I was, what? 20. <laughs> you know, so I, I now know many happy lawyers, but, it, but back then I didn't know any. Uh, and so I left the post office, went back, um, went back to my dorm um, and I, at my apartment then, and I just threw away all the applications. We never actually mailed out a single application to law school. Um, you know, and I figured, and I, my parents thought I was going to go to law school. They were convinced I was going to go to law school because I told them I was going to go to law school and I'd taken the LSATs. Um, and um, that, you know, that January, I was like, okay, I'm going to apply for a, um, I want to apply for like a master's program. Um, uh, and then I'll, I, want, I want to find my way basically. Uh, but then in January, I found out I missed pretty much every application for uh, 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 graduate school because they're all December 31st, uh, but except for the University of Buffalo, right? Uh, so I, 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 I submitted the one application to the University of Buffalo, um, you know, for a master's degree program there. I was accepted. They called me up. Um, because there was an error in a letter of recommendation in which my advisor had said um, I had served as his teaching assistant as opposed to his research assistant, you know, and they were like, Harvey, we have this new thing where we're starting this new program and we will sort of, you know, give you a stipend uh, and then hire you as a lecturer on the side, you know, if you will like sort of, uh, you know, sort of teach, teach for us. Um, and I was like, sure, <laughs> you know, so I, I did that. Um, and I went back to Buffalo, uh, you know, for a year. Um, uh, I was roommates with Bill Cressy uh, in that year, and um, uh, and then I just I met all these amazing professors, you know, at the University of Buffalo, like uh, Bruce Jackson and and others, uh, who are just absolutely amazing people. Um, and and I was just like, this is this is the life I want. This is the life of ideas. It's a life of being in conversation uh, with people. Um, so then I applied for uh, grad school again. Got you know you know for. Um, uh, my PhD and I went to Cornell um, and and I was there and then I talked Bill you know into uh, going back to school to get his doctorate so then Bill went to Cornell <laughs> you know as well uh, to get his doctorate um, yeah and then I from there I got my first job at Northwestern where I was on faculty for 15 years uh, and then what happens is you know I think that what Canisius prepares you for is a life of service right so you um, uh, you look to be helpful, right? You know, so you, 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 you provide service not to be the leader, but you provide service to be helpful to others. Um, and then I was a person who just served in more and more committees and then asked to sort of do more and more leadership. Um, and that's, that's what led to uh, me becoming department chair. And then uh, after about 15 years, you know, I was you know, invited to uh, consider going over to BU. And I've been there for the last two years. Um, and so it's, I think in terms of thinking about service, now is a real moment. And I think that Father C has been extraordinary at this, uh, at, you know, because I now have the opportunity to serve as a trustee of the, of the high school, um, you know, to sort of see, you know, in these moments of uncertainty, in these moments of crisis, in this moment of, of people really being anxious about, you know, uh, finances, you know, where things go are going, questions around commencement and graduation, um, I think that a real service-minded approach to leadership is important, and I've seen that being modeled really well, you know, at CHS through Father C, um, and, and I'm seeing it uh, done quite effectively as well at BU. So that's my story. Cool. We have a follow-up question to that. Um, 
from Malcolm Ertha. You spoke about loving CHS and it is a great institution. I'm curious what year you graduated and what is what was your experience specifically with regard to being a racial minority then? Yeah, I mean, so when I went, I, uh, so I graduated in 93. Uh, so, so the high school was a lot smaller um, than, than it is now. So my, so my graduating class had 99 students in it, right? Um, so I think that it was on the on the smaller side of, of the high school of the high school years. I'm not sure what the smallest class is on record, but my guess is that we're probably having walked down that hallway of of commencement photos. I suspect that we're probably somewhere in the top 20 smallest classes, <laughs> you know, outside of those first 15 or 20 years of the history of the of the high school. Um, you know, so I when I was there, there weren't that many students, and there were 99 students, maybe 400 overall. Um, and there, to be honest, there were not that many students of color, right? You know, so in my class, uh, it was uh, Ramir Green and 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 me, um, um, and and I think overall, I would say that there's probably maybe, you know, by the time I graduated, I think there's maybe probably less than well between the seniors, juniors, and sophomores, um, maybe like ten people to ten ten black students, something like that. Um, um, yeah, you know, and, you know, but in terms of the students who were color, it was maybe three or four of us, right? You know, it was, you know, it was uh, Neil Shaw, you know, myself, <laughs> you know, uh, Ramir, um, and that was pretty much it, I think, in terms of my graduating class. I remember my senior year, that was a point where I think there were maybe five or six black students who were um, admitted. Um, and then there was this, I, I remember people talking about why those five or six students tended to sit together um, in the cafeteria, right? Like, why are they sitting in the cafeteria together? Why are they always kind of hanging out together? Um, you know, and, and, it's, and I remember thinking that was uh, an unnecessary um, sort of, you know, sort of, sort of comment of critique because I, that's how it was framed, um, you know, and, you know, and I think that there was a real sense of connection, you know, that they had, um, you know, you know, which makes sense to me, you know, so I think that's what it was, but there wasn't, a, if, 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 if Neil and I and Ramir were to sit at the same table, there would have been like nine other empty seats or something like that, <laughs> you know, so, so that really wasn't, um, uh, it was, it was just a different experience because there were so few, but I, what I do recall um, is in my senior year yearbook, when I passed it around, you know, for people to sort of sign it, uh, you know, one person sort of wrote, you know, about me going to college. He was like, don't, don't change yourself. And he wrote, stay white. Um, you know, and, and that was a moment where like back then and even today when I reflect upon it, I think, you know, that, um, you know, like that was a case where, you know, I, I felt like it was a denial of experience, right? Um, you know, and it was, you put in perspective, right? It's a 17 year old, you know, who, um, you know, has, has their own sort of socialization limits, right? You know, and this is where I really looked to the potential of high school, but also college and beyond to actually sort of widen people's boundaries and, and, and sense of, of how to connect with people, you know, but that was one of those moments where I thought that was kind of a bit of a low moment. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, I went to uh, the school and I, and I connected with a lot of people and I felt like I was being accepted, you know, for, for who I, I was, uh, but then that was a moment where I felt like I wasn't accepted. Yeah, but that was an exception. Okay, we have another chat question from Ben G. Hey Harvey, what are your opinions on how someone's name can influence their life, AKA hiring discrimination? Oh, that happens. Um, yeah, so, so, so there, there are a ton of sociological studies on this, uh, which is that if you take two, uh, and, and, and it's all like modeled by this, you know, so you take, if you take two uh, resumes um, that are identical, right, in terms of uh, I, mean, I mean, in terms of the level of school, the types of qualifications, um, and you give one a, um, um, a more sort of, sort of generic mid-American name, right? And you give another one that sounds ethnic in some way, right? Or it sounds, um, um, uh, or it sounds like it's coded as black in some manner, right? Um, um, you know, you know, again and again and again, the, you know, the resume that's coded as black, um, you know, does not sort of move along as quickly through the process as the one that is given the sort of more generic um, sort of name, you know, sort of with the base assumption being that is a white applicant. 
uh, you know, to the point where there's a sociologist by the name of Deepa Pager uh, who has written that uh, when she's even sort of put a sort of a white sounding applicant's name who had um, uh, experience in prison, you know, where that was recorded uh, on certain applications, that person actually placed more successfully in terms of advancing next level, you know, than the more educated sort of racially marked, you know, as in like African American uh, resume. So that exists, that exists, right? Where uh, people, um, um, their, their biases you know, come in even when um, the, the source material itself um, is, 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 is like on paper, one, one application is, is, should be stronger or at least as strong as the other one, but that's where you can see the operations of uh, race and prejudice coming into the play. Hey Harvey, uh, Brandon Little's here, class of 02 actually. Um, I just kind of wanted you to elaborate a little bit more about that. Why do you think that particular applicant, or just in general, the applicant with the um, the present time that was white, was able to advance uh, in the companies that they worked at? Well, I because I think what it is is that uh, I mean it's it's uh, I mean they, 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 these are large sample sizes, right? You know, so it's like they're not interviewing anyone to say, hey, what decisions did you make? It was just reporting back. Okay, like. Um, um, because it, it all went back to the same for people conducting the studies, right? So it's like, you know, like they were asked for interviews or they weren't asked for interviews, right? And, and that's how they measured it. Um, you know, but that being said, if you think about it, you know, there are all sorts of sort of, 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 of assumptions that get projected across um, race, you know, uh, and gender as well. Um, so, you know, when, um, when you see an application and it's, 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 it's stronger, uh, than the other one, you know, uh, and, and the ones that are imbalanced in that way, um, you know, one, one's prejudice is beginning to sort of chip away at, at qualifications, right? You would say, hey, this applicant um, is probably not going to be as strong of a worker as this other one, or this person's probably going to do whatever else. It's like whatever sort of biases and prejudices you have, you just project it across, um, you know, that resume to the point where it chips away at its qualifications, unlike the other one, which you're giving the benefit of the doubt for. Right, you're like ah, I'm sure this person is gonna be great. Um, you know, and you're not given the same opportunity for that. Uh, if you think about sort of racial violence, um, it's the same thing, right? That um, you know, when um, uh, in this case Arbery, I'm assuming, uh, but this we've seen this case with Trayvon uh, Martin, Tr Trayvon, Trayvon Martin, right? Yeah. Um, um, you know, in the same way where it's like he's 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 he like in for the Trayvon's case, right? He's in the condo association of his of his, um, I think it's, it's like his aunt or cousin or some sort, some sort of relative, you know, and he very much belongs there in the way that anyone would belong to, like visiting a relative, you know, but someone looks at him, it's like, this person doesn't fit in, right? Um, and that's what it is. It's like, it's, it's those assumptions of, of, of criminality, it's those assumptions of violence, it's those assumptions you just project upon um, a person that's totally disconnected with who they are as an individual that leads to higher discrimination, it leads to violence, it leads to these things happening, right? Um, right, like, like, like if you're running down the street in Arbery's case, um, you know, you wouldn't, you, you, you're just running down the street, right? You know, but that, but someone out there thinks, you know, you know, they associate, you know, a jogging black man as a person who's up with criminal intent, right? And that level of skepticism, that level of, of prejudice and doubt um, um, and outright sort of racism, like those things um, are not leveled evenly across all people who just choose to jog, right? Uh, so that applies in a number of situations. You know, if you're, if you're this is just for Brandon, um, if you're interested in reading um, more on the topic of implicit bias and how it affects outcomes in particular in, um, in, the, in the justice system, um, in particular, uh, look, look, there's a ton of writing and research, um, some of it more uh, localized for outcomes in specific jurisdictions, but there's a whole body of research on it and, and how outcomes for uh, different um, demographic groups are affected uh, by notions of implicit bias, regional bias. Um, you know, I've done a lot of um, jury research projects in advance of civil trials. And, um, you know, these tend to be extremely uh, closely held beliefs that people tend to have 
um, even uh, within their own demographic groups. Um, the one that always just stunned me was um, light-skinned African Americans tend to have, tend to demonstrate um, bias towards darker skin African Americans in at least in the in the jury system in the in the process of deliberation. So, but there's tons of research out of it. It's fascinating, and you know, I mean, I could probably get your email through Jay or something and and send you a couple of interesting. Yeah, no, that'd be great. No, I definitely appreciate that. I think that actually um, speaks a little bit more to what uh, Dr. Young was saying with regard to even the Trayvon Martin case. I think that the the crime there was obviously the the murder, but then the subsequent acquittal right. of George Zimmerman, Zimmerman. That was the true issue right there in terms of society as a whole, as letting this person go after it was clearly a racialized event. Um, and you know, that was I think that was more um, profound than opposed to the actual crime itself. Yeah, I mean, and, and so I'm curious to see uh, uh, just what happens with this Arbery case and now that charges are being uh, uh, made, um, you know, but when it moves to trial, uh, you know, so, uh, and there's the Trayvon issue right, as well, right? You know, so, you know, if you're being followed by a person, um, you know, with a weapon, right, whether it's a shotgun or if it's a handgun, you know, in, in, those, two different uh, in those two different cases, um, you know, when you are, when you feel like your life is at risk um, and you are fighting back for your life, but then that fighting back, you know, then serves as justification for a, like, you know, stand your ground defense, for example, um, you know, like that becomes its own sort of problem, right? You know, so it's like, it's like, like where is the, um, like, where is it, you know, where is it, where is the opportunity for justice in this sort of more abstract sort of philosophical way, uh, you know, to come in, you know, when, um, you know, you're being kind of stalked, <laughs> you know, and you're just trying to do your own thing to sort of save your own life. And even that isn't enough, you know, for um, either for you to live or for the person who um, um, injured you uh, to be um, uh, convicted. But, but I cut someone off there, you know, sorry. No. No, it's okay. It's okay. That was, uh, is it? Interesting to hear. I was just going to say to Jim, yeah, that um, uh, essentially colorism uh, is what that is. It, it happens a lot and both ways as well. Uh, it's very, very real and unfortunate issue. Um, however, also, if you were going to share any resources with Brandon there, I'd love to get that as well. I'll make sure to um, pass along emails to everybody after this is over. Um, Harvey, we have another question from Jody Galvin. Kenesha's parent times three here. How can schools like Kenesha's make a conscious effort towards inclusiveness? The, does the divide between the socioeconomic experiences can be stark at the school and scholarship students can be identified early. Uh, I think you'd be a great speaker for the students, by the way. I agree, and this is being recorded so that students <laughs> can, teachers can use it uh, later on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say that, um... I mean, a lot. I, I, will, I will admit, a lot of it is is um, um, the volunteer work, Christian service. Um, I think that um, the retreats are meaningful as well, right? In which uh, you know the the young men have to uh, sort of self-examine themselves, right? And and, 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 sort of, and and sort of think about like their lives and who they are, um, and then how they are situated in their life relative to other people's like sort of orbits and spheres. I think that's meaningful. Um, you know, I remember for me that MS retreat was, was meaningful just to, um, like there was a point where all those letters arrived and I was just like, wow, I never actually thought of myself in this sort of in connection with others, right. In that same way. So that kind of brought in my sense of perspective. Um, so I think that's, I think, I think a lot of that is meaningful. I mean, I, I remember I volunteered at a nursing home. I think that was across the street, if it's the name of it. Um, uh, and then I also volunteered at a hospital, at the hospital, you know, and just being able to, um, sort of think about like the, 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 the daily realities of people whose lives were not my own, right? You know, sort of that was, that was impactful. So I think that's, that goes a long way. I do think that, um, you know, the nature of being, you know, an all boys school with an all girls school down the street, um, um, you know, sort of requires, I think, a certain level of, of, of education and conversation about um, uh, women's experiences in the world. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, too often, 
that may not be addressed, you know, and I think that's true for society at large, but just in particular, you know, with uh, Narden being so close, I would say that if there were sort of, you know, I don't know, um, it's, it's always loaded when you have high school students, right? <laughs> you know, but, you know, but, you know, just something to sort of change that perspective of, of, uh, of us, them, you know, or, 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 essential, or, or essentializing, especially when we acknowledge the fact of the experiences that young women have when they're of high school age and college age. Um, so that is something that I think would be meaningful and impactful too. Yeah. You know, and then of course, I think that, um, you know, you know, sort of scholarships are meaningful and important um, you know, because it's like when people are sitting side by side, there's a chance to sort of talk about one's life uh, and, and experiences. And then of course, it's always important to make sure that um, in moments like this, right, when, it, when you're doing remote teaching, uh, that you're leveling uh, for the differences that um, relate to someone's socioeconomic status, right? So, you know, how do we, as things move remotely, how do you make sure that someone actually has internet access? You know, you know, how do you, like, how do you can, how can you guarantee that they, um, you know, can do their schoolwork? Um, you know, so I've felt that some schools have loaned, um, um, for computers, for example, you know, others have just made a habit of printing out sort of uh, work material and mailing it to students' home addresses so they actually have access to the work. Uh, but, but those are things that I think, if you look at high schools, if you look at uh, colleges, um, you know, this move to remote teaching COVID has been really devastating on a socioeconomic uh, level uh, because you, you're, you're sensing and you're seeing, um, 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 we, 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 we often assume that, hey, once you walk through those doors, we're all the same. But now that people are doing remote education at home, you know, they, the differences are becoming much more uh, revealed than they were previously. Yeah. You know, Harvey, I was going to mention, it's Dave Sansomino that, you know, um, when I started as at, at the high school five years ago, it was uh, an interesting point when Andrea Turpek Enders was named as principal, right? And she's been now principal for five years uh, throughout my entire time. I can tell you that we had a football game uh, early in her tenure, when the other side of the stands were chanting, who's your principal? You know, and, and we used that a bit as a teaching moment with our own students about, well, what's wrong with that? Well, why, why wouldn't that ever be a chant, guys? You know, they would, and, and, but it's hard to find sometimes, I find in, in, in a school setting, folks who are willing and to have the conversations with kids, whether you know, it's about all these kind of topics that we've been running through today, because I think folks don't have a natural comfort zone in it, you know, and, and that's what I find. And the school has changed tremendously, right? Half of our faculty is women, half are men. We have just a few Jesuits in the school, and we've seen a, a, a growing population of, of non-white students. Andrea and I gather our Muslim kids together, our Jewish kids together. We gather our students of color. Uh, we, uh, we gather our gay students, uh, students who identify within the LGBT community. Uh, so we have a lot of conversations, we do a lot of listening, and, uh, but it's always a challenge, although we do it in more subtle ways, to have sort of larger conversations, you know, with, with our school community. And because often we want to do it by year or because of, of maturity levels. What's your sort of sense of what might be a good way to approach that? You know, it's always about carving out time and who can do it and, and how do you do that? But they're so crucial. Right, yeah. I mean, I think it's embedding it in your... Um, it's, it's not an everyday thing, right? You know, because it's like there's a, there's a lot that happens in the course of a day that needs to be done. Uh, but I think it's embedding it within the curriculum, right? So it's you're finding a way at multiple points across the year, um, you know, within your classes, you know, to um, have these conversations. So maybe it's um, um, you know within an English class, uh, it's 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 what text you're looking at, and then the experiences that are being shared related to within literature. Uh, race or gender, right? And then using that as a prompt for conversation. Um, maybe within um, the sciences or math, you know, there's a way of sort of profiling um, and introducing the work of, of prominent women um, uh, or URM um, sort of mathematicians and scientists as a way of, again, letting people know that the, the, the larger world out there, you know, um, includes all these people, right? I think, it's, I think that's kind of what it is. Um, you know, so you want to have, and this is what I do at BU, is I'm, I'm quite conscious of who I bring in, you know, so that, um, and I don't make a big deal of it. I don't have like a diversity series. Um, you know, I have like a series of guest artists who come in and, um, 
they are they they are diverse right and and you know and it's not framed and bracketed as they're diverse because of diversity series it's like no this is my excellence in whatever series and um and indeed the people look um like the people in the world right you know so i think i that, i think those are things that are important to do and probably the last thing to do is just to acknowledge how difficult and uncomfortable it is to have the conversation um i mean if you if you just if you just if you begin with that to say that it's going to feel awkward and we are dealing with you know uh, people whose primary frame of thinking about race or gender or sexuality or whatever else is going to come from their home environment right and it's it's it's, it's the high school's um, environment that, that creates the opportunity for a shift um, you know there are going to be mistakes because people will repeat the things that were said by by the grandparent or by the uncle or the aunt or whatever else uh, so as long as you sort of create the ground rules that you, where you say we're going to have these conversations but mistakes will be made um, I mean or errors and phrasing that are not ideal will be made you know but let's value those who are willing to have the conversation you know so, so, so it's all of those things but I would say I wouldn't do a once a year diversity lecture um, that would not be successful so it's a it's almost six o'clock at this point Harvey I want to make sure before we go any further that you're okay or do you have to step yeah. away? Yeah, we go over a few more minutes, five more minutes and give people a chance because there is such a thing as Zoom exhaustion. I understand that. <laughs> uh, we did have another question from um, uh, Felicia, who's a, a parent. Uh, what are your thoughts on microaggressions in school or the workplace? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking about it in that uh, it's 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 more generally a culture of respect, right? Um, and you know, I mean, we want to be able to call them out and help people to see what they look like, you know, that um, you know, and they can vary. Um, so I don't know. Like, I, I, it's like sometimes it's it's, it's I'm in I'm in um, um, like email exchanges with groups of people, and and that one person who endlessly refers to everyone as guys. Hey guys. Hey guys, you know, and it's like a third of the group are women. Um, and, 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 you know, that's denying a person's sense of, of, of who they, you know, so, so, so it's, it's often the, the idea of microaggressions sort of stems from, um, it's, it's the sort of the, it's the, it's the, the day to day, it's the granular things that sort of one's experiences in their lives um, that then accrue um, to be impactful, right? I know from the work in psychology, but the danger of microaggressions is that they actually lower one's school performance. Um, so if you are, are walking into a school and you have an exam, for example, on, at two o'clock, you know, but then you've been sort of um, harassed in some way, there, there, there's been something that's been said that kind of, had, had, you, know, you know, that sort of triggers you because of, you know, that there's some sense of racial sensitivity, of gender um, insensitivity, you know, then those things become things you're sort of thinking about, um, you know, when you're sitting down for the exam. Uh, so we know from psychology that, you know, there is a real um, uh, negative and downward uh, impact upon one's uh, academic performance. And here I think the work of Jennifer Richardson, for example, um, you know, on sort of microaggressions and test performance. So, so but it's, it's part of the larger culture of respect. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, if you have, and I think CHS does a, CHS does a, does a pretty good job of this, right? You know, that if, if, you're, if, you're, if your leading narrative is one that, you know, we are being respectful of others, or our, our, our environment needs to be one of support, um, then it helps put it in context. You know, where the microaggression part becomes the most dangerous is when people don't know how to understand its appearance, right? So if you feel as though that microaggression uh, might be something that's just commonly representative of, of the school, then that's where you feel like you're, um, uh, at a loss, right? As opposed to being able to ground it in the actions of an individual. Does that make any sense? Um, sure. Okay, should we do one more and then sure. and call it? Let's see if I have, I don't see any more in the chat. So I'll, I'll, I'll just ask, so you, you mentioned um, using guys when you're talking to a group that's at least partially made up from women. That's something that I've done myself and been corrected on um how, how do you that one to me is is it's such an easy one that we do all the time how do you politely i mean it's got to be hard for somebody to correct that right like how do you what's a how do you correct that basically without i don't know i just 
it feels like that would be something very difficult for someone to sort of point out. I just tell them. Yeah. Just to say, I mean, I, I wouldn't do a, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shame the person, <laughs> right? I, I wouldn't, like if it's an email exchange, I wouldn't reply all and be like, hey, you know, you're being insensitive by saying, hey guys, you know, but I would shoot it, you know, in, in the same way there's the, the, the handy little chat box, you know, in the, in the corner here. Um, you know, I would shoot the person an email or talk to them on the side and say, you know, hey, I know you're a great person and I know you're just trying to be casual and, and fun and playful, but let's acknowledge the fact that uh, you're not actually being inclusive with this language. So why don't you just try something else? And if you say that more often than not, a person will, um, you know, sort of change their, you know, change their, uh, uh, the way they engage these things, right? And I, and I would say the same thing applies even more so than that with gender, uh, gender pronouns. Um, I mean, one of the, the more devastating things I've seen just from talking with students is, you know, a student who, um, you know, um, you know, whose sort of preferred pronoun um, is actively um, ignored by family, friends, teachers, um, you know, so, you know, that is something that, you know, requires, um, you know, greater attention, I would say, um, you know, and especially if you're in a classroom where you're dealing with lots of people, it could be difficult to keep track of that, but one needs to try their best to do that, um, rather than sort of laughing at all, which, which I've seen a lot. Um, and then there's a part of us, which is sort of the grammar part of us, um, you know, which is that they and them uh, work really difficult. It's really difficult with 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 verbs, right? So it's um, you know they is going to the store, right? You know uh, that sort of thing. Um, you know, but there's to put in context. Um, you know, I think about the history of these things, right? And you think of the First Nations, where around gender identity, you know, the, the language is two spirits, right? Yeah, you know, it's like you're you're, you're a two spirit person. Uh, so if you sort of think of it in that way, you know, then it makes it a lot easier to sort of think about why it's not, you know, why it's they and them. Um, and then that helps you with, um, you know, how to proceed with, you know, sort of verb conjugation related to it. You know, but that's the thing I've seen the most. You know, I've, 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 I've seen so many examples of, um, of students who, um, you know, just feel like they are not being seen because um, their preferred pronoun is actively being um, you know, not used. And, and, and you think about it, it's easier just to call someone by their first name, <laughs> right? You know, like, you know, it's like, it's really not that hard to be like, hey, Jay, right? Jay, what do you think about this, right? You know, so if you're really at a loss, just go by their first name, um, you know, but when you're actively being like, I'm not going to do this, I'm going to choose this thing that you've said not to do, then that's where it gets really uh, difficult for a person. And they feel particularly um, disempowered. So, all right. Um, on that note, <laughs> so, like, but thanks so much for this. This was, this was a lot of fun. Um, thanks for your time. Uh, thanks for Zooming. And uh, I'm glad this exists. But again, most importantly, I'm really glad that, you know, these lessons around inclusion, these lessons around being a person for others, these lessons about respect um, and, and, and self-awareness in terms of one's own social application, you know, are kind of car are, are part and core of the teachings at Canisius High School. You know, so these are things that I think I learned at Canisius initially, and in some cases I may not have fully realized it, um, but upon reflection, um, I can look back upon many, many lessons, many, many conversations, certainly a whole bunch of signs within the high school as well. Um, you know, and certainly the, the model uh, with which uh, Father C and, 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 and the faculty at the time, the faculty currently um, lead by and set, um, it's, it's just a great and important um, perspective to have on how to engage the world. So thank you.